Okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining Global Cleveland's last day of this wonderful Sister City Conference. Uh, this panel is going to be focusing on economic development and international co-investment in the time of pandemic. Certainly a topic that we're all very interested in these days. I am Mindy McLaughlin. I'm Managing Director of Global Business for Team NEO, the Regional Economic Development Office for Northeast Ohio. And joining me this morning, we have some very distinguished globally focused panelists who are going to give us their thoughts. We'll start with Danny Seabright from the US UAE Business Council. We have uh, Sudhir Achar from EOX Vantage and Terry Smagala from the Eaton Corporation. We may have some other friends that are joining us along the way, uh, but we can go and get go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, Recognizing that the world and the global markets that we work in are very different due to COVID-19, the importance of relationships is higher than ever. So in this panel, we're going to seek to find out how our panelists have thought about questions like the effect of COVID-19 on their businesses and their home markets, perhaps how those supply chains have been affected, uh, the view of Cleveland during this time, and how sister city ties can help strengthen our business connections. So with that, each panelist is going to have five or seven minutes to talk about <clears throat> and what they're thinking about. And hopefully, uh, Danny, I can call upon you to get us started off. Thank you, Mindy. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you, Mindy, and also with my fellow panelists today. Um, please me, allow me to begin by thanking Global Cleveland, particularly Elizabeth Kusma, as well as its president, Joe Simperman for organizing this panel uh, as part of their annual Sister City Conference. By way of background, I lead the US UAE Business Council, which is a Washington DC based bilateral trade association dedicated to advancing trade and commercial ties between the United States and the United Arab Emirates. I spent half of my time in the United States and half of my time in the UAE. Uh, although the last few months I haven't been traveling nearly as much. Um, we have approximately 150 members, uh, over 200 members actually in our network, <clears throat> excuse me, and we operate in a number of different business verticals, including healthcare, manufacturing, high tech, uh, just to name a few. Of course, the subject of today's discussion is the things that we can do to be more prepared to end the pandemic and how we can use our sister, sister city connections and relationships to do so. In this spirit, I would like to talk a bit about lessons learned from the UAE, UAE's COVID-19 response that might be applicable here in the United States and the important role of Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in the UAE's response. After that, I'll touch briefly on the ties between the Buckeye State and the UAE, and especially between Cleveland Clinic and Abu Dhabi. Um, the UAE ta has taken the pandemic seriously, very seriously, I should say, from the very start and has generally handled it very well. Collaboration between the private and public sectors has been very strong. For those of you who are not familiar with the United Arab Emirates, its economy has traditionally been based on oil exports, but over the last decade has diversified into a variety of other sectors, becoming a place to travel, vacation, and conduct business to con con connect east and west and north and south on the globe today. The pandemic has significantly impacted these, these key areas of the UAE's economy. Its flagship airlines, Emirates Airline and Etihad Airlines were temporarily grounded as countries closed their borders and global travel came to a virtual standstill. Meanwhile, oil prices fell to record lows due to the decreased global energy demand. In response, UAE, federal, emirate level or state level, and private sector institutions have implemented stimulus packages and initiatives to mitigate the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. These economic shocks also prompted UAE leaders to create a more streamlined future forward government, which took office in July. As a result, the UAE is said to be better positioned to realize a future in which women are represented, youth are heard, and tolerance and acceptance, including with Israel, as we've all heard recently, are promoted. Uh, I just want to say that the UAE has consistently been ranked by global institutions in the top 10 countries in its COVID-19 response. 
And this is very, very, very important to the UAE to be a leader in every way uh, with regard to COVID. The first, the first lesson that may be applicable to Cleveland and other American cities is that from the beginning of the pandemic, the UAE put a huge emphasis on testing and data, science, which is one of the reasons why its death rate is so low. As of, as of late September, the country has conducted 9 million tests out of a population of only 10 million people. Second, the need for a centralized health data repository became even more important during the pandemic. Abu Dhabi's health information exchange platform run by Malafi has connected private and public health institutions with its database system containing patient health information. information. This has, this been, has done been done in a secure, in a secure and, private and private way. way. Uh, the UAE government, government took a proactive, proactive approach. approach. I'm getting a little feedback. Perhaps folks would want to mute on the other side. I think I'm getting feedback. You know, Danny, I'm actually able to mute folks. So, Bruce, I just muted you because I think you had some feedback. So, um, so keep going, Danny. And if we have additional issues, I will, I'll, I'll unmute you. No, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mindy. Thanks, Mindy. The UAE government took a proactive approach in mandating the acceleration of connecting all of its laboratories. Malafi's health information exchange platform is helping the government track the spread of the virus. The third lesson relates to medical equipment. Starting in May, the UAE used its local manufacturing capabilities to partner with an American company. Strata, an air, previously an aircraft's parts company that built parts for Boeing and, and Airbus airplanes, um, but belongs to the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund Mubadala, part, it partnered with Honeywell to respond to COVID-19 uh, demands for PPE. The manufacturing line at Strata's Aline shifted from producing aero parts to N95 masks to protect medical workers. The UAE went from importing the mask to providing the mask to other countries in the broader region. And finally, the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of telehealth as, as healthcare providers have increasingly offered virtual visits to minimize exposure and risk to patients. At one point, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which I'll just say a few words about in a minute, was reported uh, using telehealth for 50% of the consultation through its virtual visits service. During this pandemic, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi is also drawing on its existing relationships by involving their doctors and experts back in Cleveland. A, a, a word about Ohio and uh, Ohio's relationship with the UAE. As many people know, the, in 2016, Cleveland Clinic opened Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. This state-of-the-art institution, another Mubadala company, offers world-class care to patients with 14 institutes and six centers of excellence. The hospital's first CEO, Tomislav Mihailovic, who then became the president and CEO of Cleveland Clinic in Ohio in 2018, is a very close friend and colleague. Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi is continuing to innovate and expand and is currently breaking ground on a new cancer treatment center set to open in 2022 on the, camp, on the main campus in Abu Dhabi. This relationship is part of, a, of broader ties between the state of Ohio and the UAE, and more specifically between Cleveland and Abu Dhabi, which are deep and multifaceted. For instance, Ohio is an important trading partner for the UAE. In 2019, Ohio businesses exported more than $628 million worth of goods to the UAE, making Ohio the 10th biggest American state exporting to the UAE. This is a tremendous amount of jobs in the United States from this economic relationship. The majority of Ohio's exports to the, U to the UAE concern transportation equipment, followed by chemicals as well as non-electrical machinery. The UAE has also established ties with Cleveland at a more local level. In 2017, the UAE Embassy in Washington, D.C., led my, by my dear friend and colleague, Ambassador Alateba, partnered with the Cleveland Clinic Foundation to donate a soccer field to the Franklin D. Roosevelt School in Cleveland's Glenville neighborhood. I believe all of this bodes well for the future of the Cleveland-UAE relationship and will hopefully, hopefully lead to the establishment of a Cleveland Abu Dhabi sister city partnership sometime in the future. I'm really looking forward to uh, pushing, uh, promoting, creating closer ties between Clevelanders and Emiratis uh, for the future. Thank you so much, Mindy. Uh, that concludes my remarks.
Thank you, Danny. Sounds like you've got a lot of great things to work on with the UAE US and wonderful to see um, positive uh, things happening around around the world. Uh, next, uh, we'll move to our next panelist, Mr. Sudhir Achar from EOX Vantage. Sudhir, I wonder if you could give us some thoughts on especially the sister city relationship with Bangalore and some of the other topics that, that you're interested in. Thank you, Mindy. Again, and I, I think you need to unmute Danny. yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mindy. And I want to echo what uh, Danny just said. Uh, thanks to Global Cleveland to give us a chance to be a part of this panel. And also Elizabeth Kuzman for helping us get to this, um, uh, you know, state. They've worked very hard for this. Uh, round of applause for all of you. So my name is Sudhir Achar. I am the CEO and founder of EOX Vantage. We are a technology company based out of uh, Beechwood, Ohio. I came to Cleveland in 1991 to do my master's in Cleveland State University, straight from Bangalore, India. So I'm raised thoroughbred a Bangalorean who came to Cleveland and I've been in Cleveland for ever. I'll give some time to Bruce here. All right, so so I've so been a Cleveland Browns fan, Indians fan, Cavaliers fan, and um, Worked for corporate um, America here in Cleveland, some very good companies like Philips and then um, DataTrack, et cetera. And then we started our own business. And uh, me and my business partner, who's also a Bangalorean and a US citizen who was living in Dallas, Texas, we started doing some business with Terry's company, Eaton Hydraulics. And uh, we did it some manufacturing component outsourcing because Eaton at that, that time was growing and Asia was booming. So they wanted some uh, manufacturing partners. So we were able to um, tie a relationship with one of the Tata's companies called Titan. And um, that's, that emerged our company, EOX Vantage. And Bangalore, a little bit of history about Bangalore. When I came to Cleveland, the population of Cleveland was half a million and Bangalore was 4 million. Today, Cleveland is not half a million. Bangalore has gone to be 20 million, 12 million rather, 12 million in population. Bangalore is the third most populous city in India, and it's the fifth largest metropolitan. Most of the city, Bangalore is urban, but there are some still rural areas. Bangalore is home for highly recognized colleges and research centers, and it's second in the literacy rate of 83%. And what we did was we strategically put our offices in university campus towns. So we have very good relationship with universities. So we have it in two different locations, which is about 40 kilometers apart. And Bangalore is called as the, um, is one of the major economic hub and considered as the Silicon Valley of India. It's considered as one of the best places to do business. Texas Instrument was the first one to have a campus outside of US and then they landed in Bangalore first. And Bangalore is very well connected to the rest of the country by the, um, railways so that makes it very easy for people to get in and out of Bangalore and believe it or not one other fact that I was able to find was there is a town in Bangalore called Cleveland town so because it goes back in history the British have named a lot of different areas as like Benson town Fraser town but there is a very big affluent area called Cleveland town so there's a real good relationship with uh, Cleveland and Bangalore and it us because very educated, like I said, 83% literacy and very good universities, um, solid companies, manufacturing companies are phenomenal there. You have very good labs like Biocom, etc., to do healthcare and a lot of good tech companies and good resources that you can tap into. Like what we do is we are a technology company and then we help our clients by doing 80% of the work in Bangalore and 20% of the work here. So there is a big cost saving that we give our clients uh, because of the you know skill set that we can tap into. So now during this COVID situation, uh, how did we handle this? How did our team be able to sustain business? Because we have 400 people plus in India. And if you look at it, nobody had expected, anticipated or forecasted the impact this pandemic would have. Some of our clients who work directly or indirectly in airline industry, hospitality industry, sports, recreation, they took a big hit. They are operating at 20 to 30% and they're waiting for a strong fourth quarter. 
you know, again, a very optimistic hope it happens. And for some of our clients, because we service a lot of insurance brokerages and um, transportation logistics companies, which are not very technically that savvy. So for them, work from home was a big challenge. And because they didn't have ways to parse out tasks for their employees, they didn't have ways how to have visibility, performance control over their staff members. Data and security brought in new challenges for them. And you think about it. Now, every employee had their own infrastructure. What I mean by that is every phone, every laptop became vulnerable to data security issues. Now, as far as EOX Vantage is concerned, we are ISO 9001 and 27001. So we had planned and we always do our business continuity planning and testing. What I mean by that is we have a set of people who follow processes. They work from home, they work from rural areas, they work from remote areas with security protocols. So we were well versed about it. And as luck might have it, one of my primary care physicians, uh, Dr. Mukunda here in Cleveland, Ohio, he's on the safety board of COVID-19. He had called me and given us a heads up saying that there might be a shutdown and lockdown. So we better, we better be prepared and do whatever you have to do for your personal and business reasons. So immediately we took actions because you have 400 people and infrastructure is not like what we have here in Cleveland. So it was a challenge for us in India. Our IT staff worked 24 seven. We made sure all of our employees got their laptops or whether it is desktops, we sent them home, brought them home, uh, you know, 100 kilometers, you know, 150 kilometers, which is what, 100 miles, 125 miles away to their homes. And we make sure everybody got their own dongle. What I mean by dongle is hotspots so they could connect to our secure Wi-Fi system because we didn't want them to be using their personal Wi-Fi. For us, our customer data is most important because we deal with personal information. Sometimes it could be HIPAA information, etc. So that was very important. So what we did was we installed um, software, special software like SOFO and some other, um, you know, white labeled security software protocols on laptops. And we were very open and we told all our employees, we have to do this to make sure critical data is completely controlled and our customers knew about it, complete transparency. We engaged the customer uh, service team. So they were talking to our customer constantly and then we shared data on a daily basis. Along with this, the other thing that we did was safety. We took very good measures to make sure our employees and their families were healthy. And we put all the healthcare protocol, et cetera. And believe it or not, during this time, because we were able to be very conscious and very transparent to our clients, our business started to uptick. And uh, you know, we got about 20 to 30% more business. And we were able to help our clients get digitally transformed. So it was a real good exercise and uh, we hope this COVID is, you know, the vaccines are coming in sooner so that we can get our customers back into their full, full fledged business. So the challenge has been really accepted very well with our company and uh, well, we hope to serve our customers better. Thank you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Sidney. That's that's really interesting to, to learn a little bit more about how the role of technology is played in your company in this time. I think we've all experienced a little bit of that. Um, you know, next we're going to move on to Bruce Lowe. Uh, Bruce is with the Taft Statinius Law Firm and also wears the hat of being part of the British American Chamber. And I know we're all excited to hear what's the latest and greatest going on um, over in the UK. Uh, Bruce, can, uh, you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Mindy, and thank you for uh, setting up this session and uh, inviting us to participate, uh, thanks to Global Cleveland. Uh, also, uh, I was interested to hear, uh, there's a couple of common things, both with uh, um, Sudhir and uh, uh, Danny's comments. Uh, you know, we too uh, have um, in London, the Cleveland Clinic is setting up a, a major hospital facility right now. And uh, so, you know, it's got a big presence there that uh, they're quite anxious to make sure it's a success. And also is, you know, going to be featured or impacted by uh, the free trade agreement negotiations that uh, are ongoing right now. Um, the, uh, also, the other 
Sudhir's comments uh, amused me regarding keeping the British names in Bangalore. You know, like, uh, you know, we can't let go somehow sometimes. And uh, I was uh, I was amazed actually when I went to Israel about um, uh, four or five years ago, and they still have British names there too. The Allenby Bridge. I was amazed. I would have thought they'd have replaced it with something else. <laughs> But uh, anyway, maybe it's something to do with cricket. <laughs> um, anyway, the British American Chamber, uh, you know, as Mindy mentioned, is something I co-founded with my uh, recently departed, sadly, uh, uh, co-founder David Silk, uh, just uh, over 25 years ago now, and uh, it's one of 22 British American business associations around the U.S. and U.K obviously mostly located in major business centers in the U.S. and U.K., who work with the U.K. and U.S. government organizations and economic development agencies in the private sector, uh, and uh, are member chapters of the British American Business Network, uh, which is sort of the largest transatlantic private business network organization. Uh, and obviously, there are objectives are to promote and support transatlantic trade of business, particularly between this region and the UK. And uh, the membership of BAP is uh, over 2,000 companies. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, there's a, honestly, in terms of uh, uh, trade numbers, the, the, the trade and investment between the UK and the US is, is very substantial, and even between Ohio and the US, in fact. Um, just if looking at Ohio alone, uh, it, it, these are 2017 figures, um, the uh, Ohio uh, exports 2.1 billion, 2 .1 billion of exports in dollars in goods to the UK. And you can imagine that trade uh, and investment is probably five times that number. So you're probably talking, you know, 10 to 15 billion in terms of uh, investment into the UK and a pretty sizable fraction of that is coming back the other way and a lot of companies the British companies I think over 400 plus uh, have operations and subsidiaries in Ohio so we're, we're a pretty big presence here in in terms of uh, uh, involvement in trade and investment uh, and that's why what's happening is quite significant uh, Obviously, all the major companies, including Terry's East Eaton, are very much involved in, uh, in, in invested in the UK and, and in Ireland as well. In fact, technically, I, I think you're still an Irish company, right, Terry? Yes, that's right. Um, the, uh, so, so the, uh, overall, the, uh, you know, while I think we suffer British, uh, I mean, companies here doing business in the UK and the same coming the other way, you know, have, have pretty much had the same story as far as um, the challenges presented by COVID-19. But you know, there's a lot of optimism on, on, um, on both sides of the Atlantic with respect to the opportunity that is presented by Brexit um, with uh, the, the UK trade treaty negotiations. Now, those negotiations right now are um, at least, uh, they've just finished the fourth round of negotiations, and uh, progress on both sides has been significant, and they've been uh, focusing on what they call um, uh, about uh, streaming, work streaming sectors, and they've been about 16 different sectors that cover a, a wide range of um, subject matters and, and means of, uh, of uh, conducting trade, you know, anything from uh, customs and trade facilitation to market access to uh, investment, economics, cross-border trade and services, industrial subsidies, trade remedies, uh, dealing with state-owned enterprises, market access, technical balance, access to trade, all those things are being discussed. And they've got to the point where, in fact, they are in the process of offering a making tariff offers now as part of the progress of talks, which is quite a, 
a, a, a good step along the way towards um, reaching a, a final agreement. Now, uh, the uh, you know, it, notwithstanding it's a free trade agreement that's being contemplated, there are still you know agreed upon tariffs in certain respects. It's uh, that's the natural order of things. But uh, overall, the objective is to to make things. Um, very easy, much easier to trade between the countries. Um, the, I, I liked, uh, we, we actually recently had a couple of, uh, one in June and one in August, uh, two virtual, as Mindy probably uh, knows, and maybe I don't know if you attended them, we had two virtual sessions on the UK-US um, free trade agreement negotiations. The one in June was uh, in conjunction with British American Business London and New York. And we participated in with the British American uh, Chambers in Chicago, Detroit, uh, and Detroit, the three of us. And uh, uh, the number two minister, um, Greg Hans, the Minister for Trade, um, presided over the session. And it was very informative. Uh, in fact, number one, the, the Secretary of, uh, of State in England now for trade and investment is Liz Truss, who um, some, certainly Liz, uh, Mindy will remember, was here in September 2018 uh, for a very successful meeting and visit. And the UK government is clearly um, you know, very interested uh, in uh, what the priorities are of, of Ohio and Northern Ohio companies that do business in both trade and investment with and into the United Kingdom uh, as to what their priorities are. So these have been sounding boards in many respects. So both the virtual session we had with uh, Minister Hans in uh, June and also uh, the previous visits over the past two or three years since Brexit came on the horizon um, in terms of making sure that uh, they took a temperature and, and, and wanted to know, uh, were, were in the know as to what was a priority in these related relationships for Ohio's major Ohio, uh, Northern Ohio companies, and even uh, uh, mid-size and smaller companies too. So uh, they've been very concerned, and I think that's a recognition of, of the importance of this area and its importance uh, on the trade and investment uh, um, in uh, land and territory, I guess, uh, uh, with, for the United Kingdom. The, uh, the other thing that um, happened was that we also uh, had a second session with the U.S. team's perspective. We had Dan Mullaney, uh, who is the uh, assistant U.S. Um, uh, trade representative for Europe and the Middle East, also do a, uh, a similar session, and he was terrific. And the interesting thing to me was that the, uh, the, the, the positivity uh, expressed from both sides in trying to um, narrow down the areas of serious uh, uh, concern in terms of the, what needed to be drilled, really drilled down on in, uh, in terms of trying to find uh, common ground in terms of a trade treaty, uh, and as well as uh, covering all the bases uh, on developing a framework that really works well. It, it, it was interesting to me that, um, that the uh, head of uh, the CABC, uh, um, Duncan Edwards, at the introduction of the Greg Hans session, uh, talked about trade as the driver of prosperity. And I thought that uh, was a very um, good way of putting it. Uh, you know, trade between countries is the way you go forward. And I think the one of the things that's happened with these um, uh, trade treaty negotiations is that it has made everybody look forward rather than sitting back and look forward to opportunities and a better world coming out of this COVID. The COVID-19 uh, situation has only accentuated the desire, I think, to, 
to get a framework, a platform ready to come out of, of this in a very positive vein. Uh, yeah, there are, there are going to be, be things to be worked through in the, in the UK-US treaty negotiations, that's for sure. Um, things like, uh, like in healthcare, um, you know, there's a big concern in the UK to make sure that the National Health Service isn't, uh, they, they don't, the, the UK doesn't lose control of healthcare uh, and of its own um, uh, medical uh, system, which is obviously uh, very much socialized and different from, from the US model. And uh, things like in, in um, agriculture, uh, the, uh, you know, there are different regulations for, uh, you know, the, the, uh, what can be done in terms of product, um, poultry pro produce and things like that, and how, how you can, uh, how much you can engineer the, the meat that's, uh, and, uh, and if you're going to export it from one country to the other, there's got to be uniformity and acceptability. But all of this is in the process of, uh, uh, trying to find, um, you know, market uniformity of uniformity of regulation, and I think that um, you know they're, they're they're really trying hard to find the like, big objectives are to eliminate tariffs as much as possible, to find ways to stop regulatory business from impeding trade, and um, you know there's another the next round of uh, talks is going to take place in uh, later this month, so. Uh, it's a very positive situation, I think, overall. Um, as far as, uh, you know, in terms of sister city um, concepts, um, we, we are fortunate in the British American Chamber to have boots on the ground over in, in the UK. We've got two or three board members who are um, in different parts of the country who, who we link up with. There are... Um, Five or, or six different chapters in the uh, in the UK. Um, we, even though it's not our sister city, it's not that far away. We do a lot of interaction with the Birmingham chapter in the Midlands, and uh, uh, that actually they have from time to time been Yorkshire and uh, Northeast England chapters. So they're all still linked in, even if they're not formal chapters with the uh, uh, other uh, British American business network uh, members over in the UK. So in that sense, we still have quite a lot of interaction with the regions over there. And uh, that would include North Yorkshire and the Northeast. Um, Mindy, I, that's probably my, I said enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you. Bruce, that's, that was wonderful. It's, it's always great to get an update on what's going on in the UK. And before we go to our sort of our last panelists, I just want to remind our uh, viewers that we are happy to take questions uh, for the remainder of the session. And all you have to do is go to the chat function, which I believe is on the right hand side, and start start typing in your questions. Um, with that, our last panelist today will be Terry Smagala from the Eaton Corporation. And Terry, we're super excited to hear what what Eaton is doing and your perspective on this uh, chaotic year that we've been having. Great. Thanks, Mindy. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Global Cleveland uh, inviting me to participate in this. And to the year, I'm glad that Eaton had a role in bringing you to Cleveland. That's that's fantastic. I, I will say, though, that I feel a little guilty because we obviously made you a Cleveland sports fan, which, you know, I would not wish on anyone. I was at least born <laughs> into it. So, uh, you know, so, so our apologies for that. Um, you know, I, maybe just a quick uh, introduction. I head up uh, Ethan's uh, public and community affairs and corporate communications function. And uh, you know, Eaton is a 100,000 employee diversified manufacturer of um, equipment that manages power. And you know, our equipment goes into you know, everything that manages or distributes power. Uh, the, the challenge that we had during COVID was that our 100,000 employees are spread out over 350 manufacturing facilities worldwide. So of those 350 manufacturing facilities, 250 of them are outside the United States. So, you know, this global pandemic hits and you know, what's the first thing you do? The first thing you do is you want to centralize a response. And so our CEO pulled together uh, a number of senior executives for daily meetings. We had daily briefings uh, to, to understand what was happening in the field. 
to get a sense of uh, the cadence. What plants were working, what plants were, were not? Where were there outbreaks more severe than others? Of uh, what areas did governments prohibit our plants from operating? You know, what, what businesses were deemed essential and, and, and where were, were we not? Um, lots of really very, very challenging logistical uh, uh, challenges as well. Some of our plants had mass transportation issues. If you can't uh, get folks to your plant, um, then you're not going to be able to operate your plant. And in many, in many jurisdictions, mass transit was shut down. So, you know, it was really a daily uh, cadence of, you know, what's happening on the ground. The, the, the interesting thing is it's very humbling because you immediately realize that, yes, you can be the headquarters and, you know, you can be the CEO and senior executive of this 100,000 person corporation, but ultimately the game is being played on the ground. You know, ultimately what's happening to your company is a function of 350 individual community reactions to the situation. And, and, and from that, we learned a few uh, lessons, and I'm just going to very briefly touch on three of them, and we can get to questions because I'd like to, to, to get to our, our panels or our, our uh, participants' questions. You know, the first is I think that it's very true that COVID didn't necessarily change anything; it just exacerbated and heightened changes that were already underway. And so, you know, I, I don't think that that the things that that we have learned from COVID are necessarily relative any anything really really new. Uh, except it, it, there was just a new sense of urgency. There was a new immediacy to it that, that um, um, made us pick up our pace a little bit. Um, the, the first thing that I would say is that cultural literacy has never been more important in our executives. Now, that's always been true for multinationals, but frankly, multinationals have had this model where Americans go off, lead a division in Brazil or lead a division in, in India, and then come back to the United States. Well, you know, that's not really the model anymore. You know, our, our senior leadership is, comes, comes from all over the world. If you look at our senior leaders, uh, they are coming from Brazil. They're coming from India. They're coming from Europe. It's not just a bunch of Americans running this multinational company. And I think that that, that skill set, being culturally sensitive uh, and, 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 and culturally literate, really helped us in responding to uh, the COVID crisis because we were able to draw upon knowledge of senior leaders on how to, you know, how to communicate and interact with our facilities on the ground. So that, that skill is, is really, really important. The, the second point that I make is that supply chains are incredibly fragile. You know, we've seen this with the trade issues and Bruce was, was talking a little bit about, you know, the trade issues that, that have come up and we've seen this, this tendency toward nationalism and protectionism and that, that threw a monkey wrench into, into the way multinationals are organized, right? With free move, movement of goods across borders, we've kind of taken for granted. Well, you know, now we can't take that for granted anymore. You know, you look now at, at, at COVID and you realize, boy, you know, one of our plants gets shut down because of a health pandemic. And what does that do to our just-in-time manufacturing in our, in our chain of goods? And so it gives us a new dimension to risk management and, and understanding our supply chain. And then finally, I, I would say that, that the last thing we learned is the importance of trust and establishing trust between our facilities on the ground and, and our management team. You know, when you have a pandemic like this, it's intensely personal, it's intensely emotional, uh, and it's localized. You, you, the the top-down manufacturer or the top-down management structure doesn't work. You know, just because senior leaders come in and say do X, Y, and Z, that's not going to fly. You know, you really need to have relationships with your with your management teams, where where they're trusted, where you trust each other to make the right decisions on the ground. We can't micromanage from Cleveland, and and, and we found that the best results occurred where that trust really existed, where people really understood uh, the relationships, had tight personal relationships. And, and um, you know, and I think that's just, that, that's just heightened now more than ever. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop my remarks and then open it up for, for questions. All right, thanks, Terry. That was, uh, that was really wonderful to see Eaton's perspective. Um, again, if, if you are watching today's session and you want to type in a question, uh, I think uh, it'd be great if you could, could do that now in our remaining time. But in the meantime, uh, just to kind of go, Terry, off of what you were talking about with relationships and being culturally sensitive, um, can you and maybe the other panelists can join in looking at, you know, we're, we're six months from the start of COVID. Are there maybe lessons that in on October 2nd you could see that perhaps we've learned since March, say, 17th? Is there anything in particular you could point to to say, now that we know what we know, we would have done X, Y, or Z differently? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good question, and I think we're still kind of um, 
sifting through that. I think we're pivoting now from you know response to the crisis to what are we what have we learned? What lessons have we learned? I would think the most immediate is the supply chain issue, right? You know, I think that that companies that have come become used to just in time low inventory, let's get the products out the door, and then trusting that the products that we need to manufacture our next set of products are coming in the door at the same time right away, you know, that may not be always the case. And you know, how do we contingency plan for that? Um, I, I think certainly that our own internal communications cadence is something that you know, we're, we really improved because we had to, right? So how do you understand uh, you know, with 100,000 people, how many COVID cases do you have in the company? Where, where are there any questions about whether health procedures are being followed? Have we disseminated those health procedures, right? You know, we, we know centrally what we want to do in our facilities to protect our employees. Are those being executed? Um, you know, those sort of communications links um, we got pressure tested pretty quickly. Uh, and, and I think that as we, we kind of do the, the analysis of what we did well and what we did poorly, there's going to be a, a, an emphasis on, on communication uh, and, and, and those communication links. So those are my two immediate takeaways. Perfect. Sudhir, Danny, Bruce, any yeah. thoughts on lessons? Sure, sure. Um, a couple of things just to uh, piggyback on what Terry just talked about. Uh, communications. Uh, it so happened that we have EOX stands for an enterprise operating system. So on our enterprise operating system, just before the pandemic hit, what we did was we have a chat channel, like uh, you know, Slack and other uh, Microsoft Teams. We are integrated that with Zoom and other video conferencing tools. We find that so immensely helpful because you are chatting with your coworkers and just with a click of a button, now you are seeing them. And because of this distancing and everybody being in their homes, they are frustrated agitated but on the flip side we also see that our productivity and morale also has gone up especially we have good 60 to 70 percent of female staff and um, as you might know bangalore is so uh, uh, polluted plus also very highly densely populated it takes anywhere between two to three hours to travel back and forth from the offices so now the women staff they don't have to get up early to get ready and then make food and all of that stuff they get they get to spend more time with the family now because they get to spend more time with the family they are also taking care of the business they do their work they do their checks of their uh, work that they're doing the quality has gone up and like i said i think even when we get back to the normalcy whenever that normalcy is we might still consider like hybrid offices etc hybrid you know timing facilities and things like that so that's my comments wonderful um, just changing, I guess, paths for a second, curious to know a little bit about what your view of workforce has been during this, this uh, crisis. We know that there's pressure on H-1B visas, for, for example, coming into the U.S., uh, getting the talent we need from across the world into the United States for some of our critical jobs, and uh, being an election year always makes that more more difficult. So, wondered if, if any of you have a perspective on on talent, especially international talent, as it relates to uh, jobs we need to be filled here in the U.S. I will tell you that, and I alluded to this in my remarks. Uh, we look globally for our talent pool, you know, it, and you know, yes, we, we grew up as as an American company, and and we have those those values in our DNA. But the fact of the matter is that a young executive uh, in India or a young executive in Ukraine right now has just as much of an opportunity to rise from this company as any other. And the tendency that we have in the United States right now to start closing our borders and to try to kind of look in on ourselves, which, by the way, is being replicated in a lot of jurisdictions around the world right now, uh, doesn't do us any good. You know, and so the idea of trade is not only trade in, in goods, it's trade in human capital. And, and for us to not be able to have the freedom of movement uh, that we used to have, it's really down to the real uh, competitive disadvantage. And it's something that we're very concerned about. Mindy, can I speak? Yes, please. Um, I'm Mindy Kumar. Um, the reason, uh, yeah, Terry makes a very good point. One of the reasons I was opposed to uh, Brexit was, uh, and, and still am actually, 
uh, was that if, you know, if I'm a young person, if I'm a young Brit in, living in the UK, you know, I'm pretty bummed about the fact that they are uh, restricting government decision or the pub, you know, I guess it's a national decision, arguably, to um, prohibit my freedom of movement um, within the U within the European community. When I was able, um, when, while Britain is a member of the EU, to move around freely, you know, if I wanted to go somewhere in Europe, not just travel, but work, spend some time, uh, set up uh, and live in a particular uh, region for, or for some time or other, you know, there were virtually no restrictions on me doing that. That's not going to be the case anymore. And, you know, a lot of bureaucracy is going to jump back in in that respect. And, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, again, to the same point that Terry made, uh, that's interesting is that, uh, particularly from the UK standpoint, in the treaty negotiations with the US, um, the question of um, visas and mobility of workforces uh, ha has come up. And the US has tended to take the position, the US uh, negotiators, that this is a matter for Congress uh, to, to legislate, and we shouldn't really get into that. But I think the UK negotiators are saying, wait a minute, you know, if we're going to have a, a proper across the broad free trade agreement, it should include um, an aspect of making mobility of uh, employees and workforces between the countries uh, that much easier. And, and what has been suggested, and it'll be interesting to see whether it happens, is, is a visa um, that, that um, you know, that's trade related, uh, that um, allows much easier access for workers from each country, you know, from one to, to go into a company back and forth. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the example that was cited is the, uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's official yet, but in, they, they are negotiating, the UK is also negotiating a trade treaty with Australia. And they have a visa that's particular, that has come out of that that is particularly well suited to um, you know, ease of mobility uh, for trade and business purposes. And the, the, I think the UK government will want to try to push as strongly as it can for that type of visa to, to be, um, or something similar to be adopted as part of these negotiations, or at least in tandem with them. The, um, the, there's a, a fine um, immigration lawyer in town that is a board member of the British American Chamber, Brian Halliday, and he has actually come up with a framework for that sort of visa that he, he calls the BAT visa, the British American Trade visa. Um, and that has been, we actually presented that as part of the presentation um, to the Senate caucus down in um, Washington uh, on the treaty negotiations from a, an Ohio standpoint. So, you know, I think uh, it's an important aspect. Great. Um, you know, another thought I think we've had here is a little bit about the role of technology. Uh, Sudhir, you had mentioned that a little bit about how your your uh, teammates have been armed with computers and, and everything else. And of course, we're having this conversation virtually instead of being together. And I think we're all maybe it could speak for most people to say that uh, we could maybe do with a little less video calls in our lives. Uh, it would be nice to have a face to face interaction again. But Wondered if, if maybe each of you could talk a little bit about how uh, the role of technology has affected your ability to communicate with, uh, whether Terry, it's, it's your offices around the world, so here your, your folks in India, Danny, about how that's impacted the communication with the UAE, or Bruce, maybe how uh, the chamber is working with uh, the UK, um, knowing that we can't really have folks come over, we can't go there. Wondered if all of you could maybe say a few things about that. Uh, I can go first. I can speak to that a little. Um, the, 
the, the various chambers within the British American Business Network, and actually I'm chair of the uh, British American Business Council right now, have been pretty active in doing um, webinars, um, trade related usually, uh, or various uh, particular uh, sessions, virtual sessions on on event, you know the same kind of issues that they did in person um, seminars uh, or webinars before. Uh, not webinars; they did person-to-person -person meetings and events before. Uh, and that I think they're getting better and better at it. I mean, I remember at the start of this whole thing, the first few sort of webinars or, or sessions that I glommed on to weren't terribly. Um, well done, and everybody seemed to be a little bit uh, kind of uh, rudimentary or unsure about how they should go forward. But as time has gone on, I think they've gotten better. Uh, and maybe it's uh, the proliferation of services or types that, uh, of uh, like Zoom sessions that you can do. But um, you know, we've been, uh, the, the DABC chapters have been doing a lot of these, trying to keep up as much as they can with providing information and services uh, and uh, uh, virtual events to members in the same way that they did before with you know actual in in person ones and i suspect there'll be a um, a reversion uh, obviously when the time comes and the you know the lights gone again all over the world but um but only in part i think you know that There'll be more judicious. There'll be some judicious use of um, these types of virtual sessions. And, and Terry will like this. Um, I have an ad hoc lawyer network as part of the DABC. All the lawyer delegates that go to their transatlantic conferences and stuff. And I'm planning to. And they have an annual meeting at the transatlantic conference with a half day of CLE on transatlantic trade issues of various kinds. Well, this time I'm, we're, we're planning one for like three and a half hours um, at the end of November for um, you know the, the four or five lawyer sessions on the same thing. So you know it's making the most of it, and as time goes on, I think we find out more ways to make it work better. Absolutely. Others, we have thoughts on the role of technology as it relates to keeping in touch and keeping those relationships going. Yeah, sure. Um, what? Hold on, hold on, uh, Danny. I think you might be on mute. You were. I think I could see your. And then Sudhir will go to you next, if that's okay. That's fine. Oh, Danny, I think we still can't hear you. Uh... Okay. Well, while you're working that out, Sudhir, why don't you ask your question, and Danny will come back to you. Sure. Um, I mean, technology, it is evident that you need to have technology. You know, companies that don't adapt technology to digital transformation, uh, they will have to close down. There's no other two ways to do it. And I'll give you an example. We are so proud to do this, which was Harpit Silaj is a co-worker of Terry at Eaton. And um, through some connections, they were looking for their son, who's in 10th grade in the U.S. school here in Cleveland. He had to do um, a project, an internship project, and uh, we were able to do that remotely. Totally, we got him into our platform on our enterprise operating system. He was able to build actionable dashboards, and uh, he did a good six weeks project. And we believe that he gained something out of it. So we were able to do everything distinctly. So there, there is, a, you know, there is a very urgent need for companies to think about how they can do digital transformation and also work on business continuity plans. Thank you. Absolutely. Danny, we'll come back to you. I don't know if your audio is working. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yeah, I, something froze up on the platform there. Uh, just a few quick, succinct remarks. First of all, uh, we pivoted as an organization uh, as the pandemic started to try to own the space on virtual and what we do literally at the end of March. And uh, we realized very early on that as a membership-based organization, we had to continue to show great value to our members 
or their question would be, what's the point of continuing, uh, you know, the membership? So we we tried to master the uh, the digital platforms. We now use five different ones, depending. Uh, the U.S. government has a requirement, for example, that they will only use Cisco WebEx. They won't use Zoom because Zoom uh, has is owned by the Chinese, and so. We're, we sort of have to be all over the map with our many partners uh, that we work with in, 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 in mastering this technology uh, and, and perfecting it. So that's one point I'd like to make. Uh, it's very, very important to be uh, good at this and, and to be and to and to work to always uh, show more value uh, in the new normal. Second point I'll make is, and we have many Fortune 50s and Fortune 100, 100s who are their mem our members, and I talk with them all the time. And uh, this is not going to go back to the way it was before. Uh, we are not going to travel. Uh, big, huge American co companies are not going to expend the dollars uh, to have their executives and others travel the way they did in the past. They've learned that we can be more, we can be efficient, and we can save money, and we can get business done using uh, this technology and these platforms. Now, I'm not saying it's that we're not going to find some balance in the middle, and we're not going to. We're certainly going to come back to some amount of travel but it's never going to be the way it was before. And again, these platforms will continue to be important and we will have to continue to master our utilization of them going forward. I'll stop there. It uh, looks like we have a question from Sergio. This is about uh, Robles, about free trade. Hopefully this will be a thing everyone can, can uh, participate in. Uh, Sergio's question is, there are winners and losers to free trade around the world but it appears that there are many people left behind, especially in Ohio. How can, um, how can businesses convince those that are left behind that free trade brings prosperity? So I, I suppose this is a question a little bit of, yes, between UAE and the Brits and, and USMCA and, and everything else going on, what's your perspective on free trade as it relates to sort of bringing uh, perhaps underrepresented people um, into the fold? Well, I'm just going to make a statement. Uh, this is globalization has been an issue that has vexed both Republicans and Democrats in our country for many years. And my, from my point of view, the biggest issue that we, that our government uh, across the board has failed to do for for folks uh, as free trade has has emerged, as globalization has emerged, is is reeducation, is coming up with ways to 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 retreat, reteach, retrain. Uh, people that are in the process of being left behind, and we know which sectors those are as they're happening before they happen. And we've done very, very, very little from a federal, from a state level. We've tried maybe, but we haven't done nearly enough to re-educate, retool, retrain our, our citizens to be players in new verticals, in new business areas for the future. That's critical in my opinion. And let me just weigh in with, with and echo what Danny just said. He's absolutely right. I mean, I think that there, there's no question that free trade on balance has lifted uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions, out of poverty. And, and free trade is, is unquestionably a good thing net net. But it doesn't mean that there aren't significant piles, uh, uh, significant challenges and significant group. Terry's frozen there first. Step in. We cannot leave it. Sorry, did I freeze up there for a second? So, uh, but keep going. Keep going. Sure. Back. Okay. It's it's incumbent on companies like us to train. It's incumbent uh, incumbent upon companies like us to step into the void and not just leave it to the government. It's we have a responsibility to be part of the solution as well and to help those displaced by the the economic uh, uh, dislocation that takes place due to globalization. Uh, Bruce, I think uh, if you're, I think you're on mute as well. If you'd want to unmute yourself on this, we'd love to hear your perspective. I absolutely echo Danny's and Terry's point. Um, the, the thing that's always struck me over the last, particularly the last decade or so, uh, it's only the very savviest of politicians that are will, willing to admit and, and recognize that the uh, the a commercial and industrial playing field in terms of in workforce terms and makeup that's required across the United States has changed from what it was 
50 years ago and stuff uh, and things like that. Um, and, you know, if, if the children, if, if steel workers of 1950 and 1940 and 1960 wanted to send, wanted their children to go and work in the steel mills or on assembly lines or of various kinds, the way they did, they themselves did. Why did they send them all off to college who were welcoming, uh, you know, ad infinitum students to earn college degrees to, uh, to have liberal arts and various other kinds of degrees in, in plenty uh, and then expect them to go back and do the same old line jobs that they, their parents and grandparents did. It, 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 it's been insane. And, you know, as Danny pointed out, the country has to uh, find ways to adapt, to, to move with the times. Globalization has made that happen and com countries have to fall into line. It's progress. Um, you can't just uh, have the same old ways and the same old industries and the same way, you know, movement, movement of industry and commerce is going to happen anyway. So, you know, society has to fall into place behind. And in the US, it's something we've been very slow to do because, you know, the, the old habits die hard. And, and yet from an educational standpoint, you know, things, things have changed. Many more students go to, you know, children of families who, of, who, whose parents didn't go to college now go to college and come out expecting a different kind of job from what their parents and grandparents did. Uh, that's my sense, anyway. Thanks, Bruce. Well, we are actually at uh, the end of our time this morning and want to be respectful of everyone's calendars and schedules. So uh, for those of you who are, are viewing this session, please join me in thanking our panelists for their time and for their thoughts. And um, we really appreciate your, your attention to this. Of course, a global, our, our world is a global economy, as we've talked about here for about an hour. Uh, Northeast Ohio continues to be in a good position, whether it's about trade or investment through companies um, like those and organizations like those on this call. So uh, should you have additional questions in the future, please do reach out to our friends at Global Cleveland. They are the reason we are here today, and I think they want to stay in touch with everybody who's joining on today's call uh, as we navigate what's gonna be this sort of next normal. So thank you again for your time and enjoy the rest of your Friday and weekend. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you.